of, of the knowledge of your people. And you recite that song, and everything is good. One morning you wake up, and 85 of them are gone. What do you do? 15% left, what you do is you scramble around, you try to remember, you travel to different places and hear other people's interpretations. Some of them have new words for you. So that's what the process we're doing right now. Like my brother here is talking about, that revitalization of our understandings, re revitalization of, of our, our cosmology. We're, we're, we're in the process right now of uh, going around, of uh, retracing our methodologies, of re relocating that, that knowledge that's gone to sleep. Because the elder told me, don't be discouraged because that 85% is not lost, it's dormant, it's sleeping. The way that knowledge was gained, was gained through ceremony. The way that knowledge was gained, was gained through, through vision questing, was gained through dreaming, was, ga was gained through traveling, was gained through meeting new people and looking at new perspectives, was, was gained through traveling and seeing new things, it, it was gained through dreaming. Those things is how we gain our knowledge. And we still do those things. And all the basis of that is the language. And we still do those things. So therefore, that knowledge is sleeping right now. And the young people now are the ones that are going back to, to institutions such as this. And they're reconnecting with their culture. Because for where I'm from, our young people aren't getting our culture on the reserves. Because of the influence of the, uh, the churches and the colonization, they, they think uh, our, our understandings, our, our uh, History is full of superstition, full of bad medicine, full of everything bad. So the kids leave those reserves and they come to the cities, urban areas, and they reconnect to their culture through education and through places such as this where they reconnect to their, their history. And, and from that, they start asking questions and learn about their, their languages, they learn about their culture and their history, their ceremony. And then they take that back home to the young people back home who are under the yoke of, of, of a, a very oppressive uh, church church understanding where they smother the young people and so we have crises right when i left home uh, one of the communities just north of north of us from winnipeg in manitoba they uh, declared a crisis 17 young people could try uh, attempted suicide in one night two of them actually succeeded and this is just the one small community of 600 people so something's terribly wrong someplace and those kids are asking for, for their knowledge. The kids are asking for their languages. The kids are asking for their history. The kids are asking for their ceremony. Because they see the young people that leave and come back and how proud they are of who they are. And part of that process of that colonization is exactly that. But we are gaining that knowledge back. We are reacquiring those skies. This is a, my, my people's sky. It ain't what child is but the Dakota people, the Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee people, the, uh, the, the uh, Maori people, the uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, everybody's reclaiming that sky. And the interesting thing about that is that Bhagwan Gizik, that hole in the sky, I've had the opportunity to travel pretty much all over the place and speak with indigenous people from all over the world. And the majority of them identify that Pleiades as a very sacred place. They identify the Pleiades as a place of origin. This is from all over the world. So I thought that that's pretty interesting. There's something, must be something to that. And uh, they, uh, they, they uh, talk about dream. Dreams also are a very uh, important part of their methodology. The Aboriginal peoples, they talk about a dream time, when everything was a dream before it became reality. The Mori people, they speak about those dreams. The Haudenosaunee, they, they talk about the dreams. A lot, of, a lot of indigenous cultures all over the world, they talk about dreams. And the interesting thing about indigenous knowledge, indigenous astronomy, is that when you look at that sky in our northern hemisphere, these stars in our northern hemisphere, these patterns, a lot of them identify very similar as Musqua the bear up there. That dipper is the bear, the hunters, they're up there. And a lot of cultures they identify with that. And one of the elders told me, don't be surprised if you come across understandings that are, are way far away from you, that are similar. Because he's, our people, what he said was, at one point, prior to coming to the Europeans, it wasn't uncommon for our people to know six or seven languages. When you think about that sentence, six or, knowing six or seven languages, that tells you 
that somebody is taking time to learn languages, but not only languages, somebody's taking time to learn culture, to learn history, to learn star stories, to learn ceremony, taking time to do that. They weren't fighting, they weren't warring amongst each other. They were sitting there taking time to do these things. And that says that uh, people were traveling around doing this. And prior to coming to the Europeans, yeah, that's what a lot of people did. They traveled around. Because all they had to do was look at that sky and they knew exactly where they were. If they knew the land, you know the layout of the land, you have a picture in your mind about what your land looks like. You know there's a mountain maybe 30, 30 miles away that way. You know there's a lake this way. You have it in your mind where you are, you look at the sky and you say, oh, that's where I am. And so wherever you were, your people traveled with you. Your Ndutemuk, your relatives, your extended family, they traveled with you. So no matter where you went, you weren't lonesome. You, you weren't away from home because home was with you. And you looked up in the sky and you knew exactly where you were. So you couldn't be lost. So you went everywhere. Anywhere you went, it didn't matter. You were home. And you ran across people and they were doing the same thing. And you didn't start fighting them because, because they, they were doing the same thing. Because there was lots of food available. They say anywhere from 60 million to 400 million buffalo. Now that's a wide, wide estimate. That's how many buffalo were here. But, but what they don't say is that there were that many elk, that many deer, that many bears, that many wolves. Those things, those things there was a mass extinction that took place in order to, to tame our people. There was a mass extinction. And then that, is, that extinction is, uh, is aimed at us now. They, they, they're still after us as indigenous people. Every little policy that's made by, by the government its main idea is to get rid of us. So there's a genocide that's still happening. I tell these young people, I tell the young people this, there's a genocide that's happening, though a lot of people don't want to hear it. There's a genocide that's happening still, and it can't be whitewashed. It's got to be shown. You, you look at all these graves that are, that are being found. Where's the big outcry on this? Why? You know? Thousands, thousands of, young, of children, graves that are covered. And everybody says, oh, oh well. So there's something, something happening someplace. So the reconnecting to our, our, our understandings, reconnecting to our cosmology, reconnecting to our epistemology, reconnecting to our methodology, reconnecting to all these things, brings back who we are as an Inyo, as Haudenosaunee, as an Anishinaabe, as Dakota, Lakota, Lakota, Sikshika. I was in uh, a place called Kananaskis outside of Calgary last month in uh, mid-September and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, speak at a, at, a, at a star gathering. It was an indigenous star, star gathering and there was a, uh, a Blackfoot astronomer, uh, astrophysicist by the name of Robert Cardinal and uh, he uh, discovered about three comets that are up there with his name lying around and he talked about that to the youth and his process of how, how he got to be what he was doing. And then we had a, an elder from, uh, he's a Yaki from southwestern states. And again, he spoke about the stars from his people's perspective. And he works with NASA, he's an astrophysicist. And he talked about this indigenous knowledge of, their, of his people. And then we had a Anishinaabe. And again, he spoke about the knowledge of his people about that. We, we looked at the Big Dipper. And each one of us, when we spoke up there, there was five of us that spoke. And we all picked the Big Dipper uh, as a point of reference. And each one of us spoke from uh, our, our own particular perspective. So the audience got to experience five different cultures from, uh, in, that, in that span of time that they were sitting there looking at that sky. And that is, 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 a, is a phenomenon that's, that hasn't been seen for quite a long time. And the young people were there, they came in groups. We had sweat lodges available and they filled those sweat lodges. We had 14 sweat lodges in three days and they were packed full of young people. And they're wanting to know their history. They're wanting to know their songs. They were wanting to know the languages. They were wanting to know their star, sky stories, their sky stories, their star stories, all this information. So there's a great, great hope that uh, things are coming back. And the, the young people are driving this, this initiative to bring everything back. And uh, hopefully we as uh, knowledge keepers can, can share what knowledge we have. So if you look at that, that sky up there, right in the center of that, there's a fish. 
in the Milky Way. And again, the Milky Way has a lot of identifiers. One of them is called Maigan Meskino. Maigan Meskino refers to the wolf's path. And so at certain points of the year, that Milky Way is, is facing north-south in the wintertime usually when it's nice and cold. And uh, the, the uh, northern lights run across the top of that Milky Way. And it looks like it's connected. And they say that's when the wolves lead all the spirits that have gone. They lead them up to the sky, to Kichikizik, that great sky. So they call it the wolf's path at that time. When you look at it, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about that fish up there, and you, you relate uh, the, uh, the narratives about that fish, then that path, it, 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 its name changes. It, it becomes uh, a Chaksipi, which is river of spirits. And uh, it, so that fish up there, we call Nameo. Nameo is the sturgeon. And for my people, Nameo is very, very important, very sacred because of uh, its longevity, because of what it, what it represents, and because of how it fed the people. It was a very important fish, Nameo. And so if you look up in the sky right there, you see Nameo, and uh, it encompasses three stars of the uh, Western astronomy. It encompasses Ariga, it encompasses Perseus, and it encompasses Andromeda. We're told that there's 13 main stars of that constellation. And again, representing one, one complete cycle, one, one lunar cycle, one lifetime, one, one, one year. But also, there's seven main stars of those 13, there's seven main ones. And these seven main ones represent generations. So we're told that at the head of that Nameo is uh, our great grandchildren. And at the tail of the mayor are our great grandparents. And we, as human beings living right now, are in the center. Ahead of us there's three generations, behind us there's three generations. And we are the, we are the seventh one, right in the center. So if you look at the mayor, the tail is touching one side of the Milky Way, which represents the past. The nose is touching the other side of the Milky Way, which represents the future. And the Milky Way itself, represents the present, that's where we are. So it's a time continuum, it's a passing on of knowledge, the process of generations upon generations. So this is one of the understandings of the seven generations. And I've heard about three or four different understandings about the seven generations. One of them I heard from a Shoshone, uh, uh, a friend of mine, he was uh, since passed on by the name of Art Montour. He, uh, he shared with me one of the teachings about the seven generations which I, I want to acknowledge is uh, passing on of that knowledge. And so anyways, we're told we live in the present, and ahead of us is the future, behind us is the past. So behind us, of course, is our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents. So our great-grandparents, that third generation, we call, there's a word in Cree we call Chapan. Chapan. We call those great-grandparents our Chapan. And they, Chapan means the ones that tie together. So our great-grandparents, Chapan, they tie together the past for us. And then we look ahead to the future, and our great-grandchildren that are ahead of us, they tie together the future. So the past and the future are tied together in continuum. And we're the pivotal point of that continuum. What we do is passed on to the next generations. So we, we, we are very uh, pivotal in this uh, knowledge process, this knowledge process of uh, passing on from, in knowledge from generation to generation. If you look at that sky and you see all those constellations, those 88 constellations of Roman Greek mythology and the Western astronomy, that represents over 2,000 plus years of knowledge being passed on from generation to generation to generation with nothing unbroken. It's been passed on. And then you look at the forefront of our of the Cree astronomy with that many constellations up there. That means there's, there's been something happened along that process, and that knowledge hasn't been passed on. But we're slowly getting that knowledge back. Because the people, are, the young people are slowly going back to the ceremonies, slowly going, going back to the languages, slowly going back to the, the places like the longhouses, and all those ceremonial places, and slowly beginning to go out and see the world, rather than staying on the reserve. 
So all these uh, methodological processes that uh, our elder told us happened prior to coming to the Europeans, so we're doing it again. And uh, the other thing the elder said is that our, our people traveled, like I said, I mentioned, our people traveled all over the place. And uh, one of the uh, points I like to make and emphasize the point of our people traveled all over the place is that uh, There was trade routes, north, south, east, west. North America, Central America, South America, trade routes. So trade goods went everywhere. The example I use is up in the Pascua Cree Nation on the banks of the Saskatchewan River in mid-Manitoba, up in Canada. There's a, they were digging, digging uh, basements. At, uh, initially, that site where they're digging basements was uh, where my people had, had their traditional uh, traditional uh, base camp. Because at, at that place there was a sacred rock, there was a meteor that was partially exposed. And it became a very uh, holy site. People from all over, north, south, east, west, and different nations used to come to that place to the whole ceremony. And they called it Muskiki uh, Essimi, the, the medicine rock, because of that partially exposed, uh, uh, exposed the meteor. And they had offered their webinars and they know just them, their prayer cloths and their, their tobacco and prayer flags at that place. And they'd hold ceremony in the fall time and the springtime when the geese were flying. And they called it the goose dance. And it was a very sacred time. And it was a time of gathering. It was a time of uh, making new friends. It was a time of uh, exchanging information. It was a time of healing. It was a time of ceremony. And anyways, at one point in uh, the early 1800s, Anglican preachers came up there was Saskatchewan River from uh, Winnipeg and from Roy House along Lake Winnipeg. And they came at that time when there was a ceremony being held and they saw the people placing tobacco and placing flags at that, at that, uh, that exposed meteor. And so they said, huh, they're worshiping that rock, we're gonna get rid of it. So what they did is they uh, took a whole bunch of uh, explosives and they tried to blow it up. But they couldn't blow it up, it was too dense. So what they did is they excavated it. They dug it up and they rolled it in the river. And when they did that, at the exact impact crater site, that's where they built the Anglican church. So to, to this day, you go to the Pa, you look for the Anglican church right across from the library, that, that's where the crater was, exactly that crater was, the secret site of my people. And this happened all over North America, and Central America, and South America. These, uh, these holy sites were, were, uh, were, were taken over. Uh, I had a really good experience. One, one of the elders, he said to me, you know, if you look at a map of North America, and you look out, look for all the names with devil in it, Devil's Creek, Devil's Lake, Devil's Tower, all these names with devil in it, you'll find that, that you can be 99.99% .99 sure that that was the sacred place of our people. And that, 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 that's a fact. It is the same. Like Devil's Tower, that was very sacred to a lot of people. Plains nations in that area. Very scary. right to this very day, they hold Sundays there, they hold fast camps up on, on top of that big mess up. So, these things, <laughs> through that colonial process, they excavated and they uh, got rid of that rock. And so, anyways, they were excavating in 1969, they were excavating in that area. They were making basements for new houses, for housing development for the town of the Pa. And they excavated a burial chamber. And in that burial chamber, there was a lady, and she was wrapped in a cloak, and she had ceremonial items with her, and she was painted in red ochre. And so, anthropologists from uh, the University of Minnesota came, and they showed up, and they started excavating the whole area, and they started doing digs, and they took away thousands and thousands of pottery, pottery shards, of uh, arrowheads, of spearheads, of axes, all kinds of uh, things they took away. And they took away that, uh, that that burial chamber with that lady in it. And they took it back to Minnesota and they did uh, testing on it. And they found that that cloak that the lady was wrapped in was a cedar cloak and it came from BC. It originated from BC. And they also found that the lady had a shell with her and that shell originated from the Gulf of Mexico. And the, the red ochre she was painted in originated from what we now call the, uh, the Dakota, South Dakota and North Dakota. And she had a uh, atoll atoll with her, a throwing dart. And the shirt on that dart, the flint, originated from the Great Lakes. So, 
up in a bus for a creation. All these things.